Matt Thieler, and you're watching Shotgun Wrestling Radio. This is the mechanic, Big Beasley, and you are listening to Shotgun Wrestling Radio. This is Rory Fox, your Central Empire Wrestling Champion, and you're watching Shotgun Wrestling Radio. This is Gavin Parker, and you're listening to Shotgun Wrestling Radio. What's up, everybody? It's Leon King here, of course, the baddest of the baddest, and you are now listening to Shotgun Wrestling Radio. I am Eric S. Knight, and I'm a league champion, and we are the chosen prodigal sons, and this is the Shotgun Wrestling Radio Podcast. This is your deathmatch daddy, Bo Don, and you're watching Shotgun Wrestling Radio. Hey, everybody, this is Brock Anderson, and you are watching Shotgun Wrestling Radio. This is Augustus Draven, and you're watching Shotgun Wrestling Radio. This is the feline phenom, JT Energy. Your experience, Shaka Wrestling. Now, for people who would be interested in this book, what's it? What's the official title of the book? So, for people that may not be familiar with it yet, uh, the the name of the book is called "My Ringside Seat to the AWA," and I called it that because I not only had a front row seat every chance I could get. To, uh, mm-hmm. When I went as a fan that I paid for, but also I was able to uh, be a ringside photographer at a lot of the Illinois and uh, Wisconsin events, uh, thanks to some of the photographer mentors they had. And uh, um, so it's it's meant to be a play on words as my ringside seat, as far as uh, I got to be at ringside to take photos, but it's also my ringside seat to seeing them outside the ring and knowing some of the the stories of seeing them uh, on the road and, and that kind of thing. So, uh, and uh, I, my goal was not to say anything uh, derogatory or embarrassing about any of the ADA. I didn't always like every one of them, but I tried to include <laughs> include positive stories about them and I tried to include a picture of at least uh, everyone that I encountered during that time. So there's a wide variety of uh, guys in there. Of course, there's my favorites who, uh, Nick Bockwinkel was my all-time favorite, which I don't think will be a secret after anybody reads that. Case. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he was he was an amazing guy. And uh, I'm, I'm really glad people got a chance to know him better after after he retired from the ring and, and got to be a commissioner and also president of the Cal Flower Alley Club. So. Yep. And he even made a trek to Waterloo the one year. Most intriguing matches that was announced, and again, we're moving to the show here on Saturday night this year again. The Impact Pro Wrestling Show is Saturday night. The Hall of Fame induction ceremony is Friday night, so don't get those two wires crossed here, folks. One thing I think is really cool, and I think it has a lot of people talking, is we. I even heard Eric Bischoff bring this one up on his podcast. Um, Okay. So it's Wes Briscoe with Jerry Briscoe in his corner versus Brock Anderson with Arn Anderson in his corner. I mean, you want to talk about two legendary wrestling families, man. It don't get much more legendary than that for a show here in Iowa. I know. And I mean, I think it just speaks to the volume of the talent we can attract and the interest we can generate by having Briscoe versus Anderson, you know, a second generation match like that. I don't know how much Jerry and Arn, I don't think their paths ever crossed too much unless it was early in Arn's career, but um, having Wes Briscoe and Brock Anderson in there. And, you know, actually I, I have our Facebook page right up right now with all the different matches and that's the one i'm looking at and i'm really excited for that match and i'll you know i'll be honest you know i usually split the duties with iron mike johnson but uh sometimes i'm gonna say well my and we're we're, we're really good about sharing i love iron mike but i'm, I'm gonna say right now iron mike i think i got this one buddy we'll we'll have to haggle <laughs> for it later yeah no it was just really cool to hear a guy like eric bischoff talk about that one on his podcast here He said if he could call me, I sort of figured that that's what it was. I'm I'm I was blown away. I actually, for one of the first times in my life, I was speechless for a good couple of minutes. Um, but I actually, you know, I I looked at the list of prior award winners. They've been giving the award out since 2006. And I mean, 
about half the people on this list have been wrestling historians for almost as long as I've been alive. You look at guys like, the, of course, Jim Melby, even Mike Mooneyham, J. Michael Kenyon, Aptor Napolitano, uh, Koji Miyamoto, uh, Tom Burke, who was last year's recipient. I mean, Tom Burke was already in the newsletter game um, before I was born, which was in 1971. So to be in this on the same list as, as these people is really mind-blowing to me and I, I almost feel like I, I don't deserve it but I think because I don't just catalog wrestling history by finding things and posting them but I actually take that information and do something with it do something that hasn't been done before we mentioned earlier the statistics I used it was a moment that I had grind been grinding for for about seven months at that point it had, been, it had been a moment i'd been grinding for 16 years at that point um just non-stop putting in work day in day out sacrificing my body just to make it to that match and i went in and killed it and i i'm forever grateful that i was able to have that match i'm forever grateful for the hoc forever grateful for my dad just to have this opportunity to do what i love at this level now with your dad being a referee obviously he's on the road all the time was there ever any you know hesitation on his part or even your mom's part about you wanting to get into the pro wrestling business because you guys are gone so much so for what i remember <laughs> uh back in 2022 i started I, I was starting to mention to him how i wanted to train and he said he wanted to essentially wouldn't have me wait Maybe he'd start teaching me some of the other stuff, but he'd have me wait until I was uh, 18 through college. And then I start, I kept pushing. I kept pushing, and then the HOC opened, and we uh, found that and realized how good of a place it was, and there was no better time to start than then. So, yeah, so for the most part, other than, so basically there was no hesitation on mom and dad's part then to be full, really. full go to they, They're my... They're my biggest supporters. All my aunts and uncles Good. are my biggest supporters. My girlfriend, my my grandparents. I have a whole support system of love. <laughs> now, as long as you've been you've been in the business for quite some time, you've obviously worked for the WWF. You had a chance to work for both Vince Senior and Vince Junior. I'd be kind of reminisce mm -hmm. here not to ask. For a lot of people, for a lot of people too, that don't really even know what Vince Senior was like. Now, from your you know time there, what would you say the biggest difference between working with Vince Senior and Vince Junior were over all those years? Well, yeah, Vince Junior had uh, an idea, you know, to go worldwide, you know, think big. But uh, Vince Senior, you know, he knew what he had up there in. Um, in New England, you know, just do the towns. And he pretty much knew how much we were going to draw, you know, with a specific card. And uh, and Vince Senior was absolutely a gentleman's gentleman. You know, when he walked into the room, you know, he was about 6'3", six, 6'4", six, in a three-piece suit, you know, his hair, not a hair out of place. And quite a gentleman and he um you know we just shook hands when i went up there and that was the deal you know no contracts or, or anything like that and uh he took care of me up there and uh you know i could have been a little more ag aggressive maybe with my career but i was happy you know like they say the squeaky wheel gets the grease but if you squeak too much they remove the wheel i'm sure you told the story a hundred times when you kind of decided that you really wanted to get into wrestling did your dad try to stop you at all or was he pretty helpful with getting you getting, getting you to the right place to go so he never stopped me per se but he did when i was uh so I've told this, like you said, I've told this story elsewhere, but I'll tell it for people that haven't heard it. Uh, when you grow up and you're, you know, five, six, seven years old, 
you want to be something different every week. One week you want to be a firefighter. One week you want to be a cop. One week you want to play football. One week you want to play baseball. You don't know. You just go whatever your attention is on at the moment. To me, my dad worked with WWE and I knew what he did, but it was just it was just his job. And I thought it was a very cool job and I got to be around it. But I don't think the moment that I figured out that I really want to do this was till I was about age 12. They would take us out to the uh, WrestleManias. They would allow the employees to bring their families as like, a, you know, as a thank you for the year. And it was almost a vacation. So it was WrestleMania 25, Houston, where the Texans play. I was sitting there and those shows were starting to get really long. They were starting to, they were doing the pre-show. They were starting mm -hmm. to do all that's when that was starting. So it was like, it turned into a six, seven hour show before they split the two nights. And, you know, it's, this is probably three and a half hours in. And all of a sudden you see the video package play and this smoke, this white smoke starts coming out. And like this very, very heavenly music starts playing. And none other than the heartbreak kid himself is coming from the ceiling in that way. He's wearing that white long yep. jacket, yep. wearing that white hat coming down. And then it was the heaven and hell match between him and Taker. And the match they had that night, I was glued to my seat, just watching every minute. And they had a hell of a match. It's my favorite match of all time. And just the way that they got had those people in the palm of their hands, something in that moment said, all right, this is what I want to do. I've made up my mind. So you to get back to your question about did he ever stop me? Once From that moment on, I knew I wanted to do it. So once I graduated high school, I was like, this is what I want to do. There's no point in going to college. Like, this is what I want to do. Well, we sat together, we came up with the foundation in Carrie's name. Um, it's grown in the past eight years to where I now travel nationwide. Um, we have spoken to over 200,000 students. We work with law enforcement nationwide. We, we speak at seminars and um, we teach at academies, at police academies uh, on drunk, impaired, distracted driving. And we become a force in the foundation community helping others start their journey and we have a victim services program so that we work with families who have been affected so it's not what i set out to do in life and i've said this and i'll, and I'll say it again wrestling helped me from being in front of twenty thousand people a night to traveling and trying to learn how to handle different people, different situations, things like that. And that's what I do. Uh, we're a 501c3 nonprofit. No one on this foundation gets paid. And I want everybody to know, no one, no one. I don't work for a living. I work for my daughter. And we, we raise funds and, and we do those things. And that was another part about coming out to Waterloo was just getting away from my new normal. So he's like, and I'm going to sell it like we got a bunch of hot women with us. And like, it's just a, it's a party. We're having the best times of our lives. He's like, if you guys are willing to record it in the actual hot tub, I will do your show. <laughs> the next day, we spend 45 minutes in the hot tub with Wes Briscoe drinking beers <laughs> and just freaking around, man, just playing around. And I, I had a blast. Uh, you know, I had a co-host with me on that show and he just wasn't as good at making friends, I guess, as some people, as other people. Uh, so like Wes and I really became buddies where they didn't, uh, and it just progressed into, I get there one year, the first night I, I, you know, I hook up with Wes, we hang out, him and I like to have our, our special powwows, you know, all about that. And, uh, 10 minutes into the conversation in his room, it's, I want to start a podcast and you're the guy that's doing it. <laughs> And I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> like, you want me to record? He's like, no, 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 I want you to record it. But you're my co-host. He's like, I can't do it on my own. You're my guy. <laughs> and it's been fucking over after that, man. Uh, to this day, that's that's a brother to me right there. That's, that's homie. Uh, we don't get to see each other a lot anymore either. 